Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Plain Bagel. I'm your host, Richard Coffin. Today, I wanted to put out a video talking about the situation in China. Yes, I know I am very late to the situation. There are already a lot of videos talking about the situation in China, including some from YouTubers that I very much respect who do a good job covering the situation. But there's also a lot of sensationalized and very clickbaity type videos out there that are claiming that China's entire economic system is about to collapse with this kind of trend of, of posting the number of days until China ends, the, China's over. And a lot of that seems to stem from this Cascades Academy video that was titled, China's entire economy will collapse in 34 days. Why 34 days? Great question. <laughs> the video never actually explains why that number is chosen uh, and what the significance of those 34 days are. But in that original video, there's this claim that the entire banking system in China will collapse in a sort of domino effect from the troubles it's currently experiencing. Five banks went bankrupt, which was spread into 20 banks, then 100, and eventually the entire banking system. Well, ladies and gentlemen, today, is that day. The video was posted on August 7th. Today is 34 days later, September 10th. So has China's economy collapsed? No. <laughs> now, now in this video's defense, there are very real concerning things happening in China right now. And a lot of stats pulled up in the video are incredibly alarming in terms of how individuals are seeing their wealth evaporate effectively before their eyes within the country of China. But a lot of people have taken that and then extrapolated to the point of saying China's economy is therefore going to collapse because of these issues currently being faced. The purpose of this video is to give an overview of the situation. I know a lot of people have done it, but my hope is to do it in a way that is plain and simple. I said it. <laughs> and to provide some perspective to the situation that I think is very much missed by a lot of these other videos about the scope of this current crisis, if you will. So without further ado, let's hop into it. The current issues playing out in China really have two focal points that a lot of people are focusing on. The first of which has to do with its real estate bubble, which we touched on briefly last year with the Evergrande video. Uh, but to give a sort of a recap, back in 2020, China's government instituted a three red line policy, whereby it outlined three leverage criteria that real estate developers would have to meet if they wanted to borrow more money. And if anyone violated all three of these, they could no longer expand their credit. And back in October of 2021, when Evergrande, the largest property developer in China, was making a lot of headlines for its own financial struggles, nearly half of the top 30 developers in China violated at least one of these three red line criteria, meaning that many property developers all of a sudden saw a very strict crackdown on the amount of money that they were able to borrow to fund their operations. And while the idea might not sound all that impactful, given that it's really just limiting the growth of credit, if you will, it revealed many problems with the real estate market in China that many have since deemed a quasi Ponzi scheme with how it was run. Uh, and to really understand it, you have to understand a bit more about how Chinese real estate works because it's very different from the rest of the world. First of all, the government actually owns all the land in China and individuals cannot purchase land. Instead, individuals lease the land from the government. So when they purchase a property, they're rather purchasing the lease to that property or the land that it's on and the value of the materials used to build the actual structure. And over the last decade or so, many property developers took on excessive leverage to expand their property development business and to sell properties, to, to develop properties, leading to this expansion of leverage within the country. And part of this was fueled by very strong demand from Chinese citizens for property in China. Because also, unlike many other countries, home ownership in China is actually very, very high. Roughly 90% of the population in China owns real estate to some extent. And a big reason for that is real estate ownership is seen as one of the main methods of investing in the country of China. Here in North America, obviously, we see the stock market as one of the principal vehicles for investing your wealth and seeing it grow. It's not really the case in China. In fact, only 5% of corporate financing actually comes from equity. And that combined with different capital restrictions from the government of China itself has led to only 7% of the population owning stocks. So anyone looking to invest their money typically turned to real estate, which over the last couple of decades has seen their prices skyrocket thanks to this heightened demand and this heightened loan activity encouraged by the governments that earned that leasing revenue. In fact, according to Forbes, since the year 2000, home prices in China have more than quadrupled, making it for some of the most expensive real estate in the world. In fact, in top cities in China, the average price to income ratio sits at roughly 34.9 times. 
meaning it would take 35 years of your full income to afford a property. To put that in perspective, New York has a price to income ratio of roughly 5.4 times. And that's a very expensive place to live. For a lot of people, this didn't actually deter their demand for real estate because so long as the price continued to rise, it was deemed to be worth it. So this led to a lot of people using not just multi-generational wealth, but at times multi-family wealth where different families would pool money together to try and buy property and led to this heightened demand for real estate over the last couple decades. And many property developers not only took on leverage to meet this excess demand, but started carrying out more kind of questionable practices that eventually became commonplace such as, for example, making a pre-sale or taking a deposit or at times full payment for a property that had yet to be built, meaning that many individuals were making mortgage payments on properties that weren't yet inhabitable. And again, because these were primarily investments, that aspect wasn't necessarily a primary concern. And in many circumstances, this led to property developers taking pre-sale funds that people had paid for new projects and using that money to fund the building of older projects that they had already committed to. And this is why we saw a liquidity problem in the space when the government introduced its three red lines, because all of a sudden these developers, which were already using new obligations to fund old obligations, lost a key source of their financing to also help fund their operations. But hey, at least these property developers still had new pre-sale funds coming in to help fund their old operations, right? Well, no. Because of concerns around the solvencies of these developers and faith in their ability to actually complete these property developments, many people started to pull back their purchasing in the area of real estate and new home sales plummeted in the country. For 2022, home prices are expected to fall 1.4%, while new home sales, or the volume of properties actually being sold, is expected to drop by roughly a quarter, 24.5% year over year. And all these concerns about real estate in China, which have really been in play over the last year or so, have only been compounded by more recent updates, uh, the second focal point of the situation here, if you will, which is the turmoil in the banking sector. Back in April this year, regional bank clients in the province of Henan found that access to their funds had been frozen. They were no longer able to withdraw their money and turned out that $6 billion worth of these client deposits had been frozen, seemingly the result of illegal lending activity, allegedly. This led to a number of protests where depositors were demanding access to their funds, including one that was held July 10th, where people met up outside the People's Bank of China and were attacked for speaking out. Now it's unclear what the extent of that banking scandal was, but after this protest, China arrested gang members that they allege had taken over regional banks, including the ones involved with that original asset freeze, and had carried out illegal lending activity and money laundering, which had caused these assets to be frozen or by some accounts lost. Now the government has since ordered these banks to release some of the funds back to the depositors, but the situation shook faith of depositors across the country who no longer believed that their funds were safe. At the same time that this turmoil was playing out, there was another hit to the country's banking sector, a mortgage boycott. It all started with a 590 word letter from angry buyers of a half-built Evergrande property development who demanded that progress continue on their property by October 20th, or else they would stop making their mortgage payments. And while the letter itself was only concerned with the single property development in the country of China, it kicked off a sort of movement. There are now over 300 property developments seeing boycotts from their buyers, with S&P forecasting that up to $356 billion worth of mortgages, or 6.4% of all outstanding mortgages, are at risk in this situation in a worst case scenario. And all this is happening in an already stressed economic environment where we have high inflation, severe state imposed COVID restrictions within the country of China, which are impairing economic output given that China has been very severe in its crackdown on COVID outbreaks. And of course, the negative macroeconomic environment where economic growth is expected to slow down or possibly contract, which would impact China's own growth, and even longer term concerns around their population, which could impact their future economic growth. So <laughs> it's not a pretty picture. It is a bad situation. But is this enough to claim that China is on the brink of collapse? Maybe, uh, but probably not, I would argue. Uh, and there's a few points I want to highlight to put this all into perspective. The first point is that, well, yes, leverage for property developers is quite high and certainly concerning with the current restrictions in place. Individual households are in a much more moderate position. Household leverage for 2021 sat at 62% of GDP and 112% of household disposable income, which by global standards is pretty moderate. In Canada, for example, household leverage to disposable income is 180%. 
which is quite a bit higher, which goes to highlight what people probably already know, which is that this is really a confidence problem of people choosing not to pay their mortgages simply because they don't believe or they don't have faith in the developers that the money is going towards rather than a household solvency problem, if you would. The second point, which I think a lot of people are glossing over is that this is predominantly an issue for smaller regional banks, as opposed to larger institutions, with most of the suspended projects being located in lower tier cities in China's inner regions. That's not to say that's not a concern, but there are wealthier cities in China and many that are contributing to the economic output of the country that haven't currently seen a major impact from what's playing out. And finally, it's incredibly important to remember that China is not like other countries. <laughs> I know that sounds like an oversimplification, but it really is true. The country is of course still susceptible to an economic crisis. They're not immune to any of these factors, but it is to say that they have very much more control over their monetary system and their citizens and corporations than other countries. Outside of mandating the release of some of the deposits held by these banks, there have also been moves to try and appease some of the mortgage stress, including allowing people to delay their mortgage payments without penalties under certain criteria, allowing people to put smaller deposits on properties within certain local governments. And over the last little while, the Chinese government has been injecting money into the system and as recent as August, even cut its central bank interest rate, which could help soften the decline in housing prices as mortgages become more affordable. You also remember that a lot of this pain started with the three red lines introduced by the Chinese government. Well, they've since actually eased some of the rules specifically for companies that choose to absorb assets from troubled developers to try and complete those projects, allowing them to take on debt to do so. And that appears to be one of the strategies that China wants to do, is to take these incomplete development projects and have them absorbed by solvent developers and state-owned enterprises in some cases, leading to a quasi-nationalization of these assets. Now, as for the banking side of things, obviously there's concern that a bank run could contribute to a currency crisis within the country, which is a valid concern, but as my good friend Yuri over at Money Macro highlighted in his own video, the country has a lot of capital controls and a massive trade surplus that gives it a lot of room to increase money supply and support banking operations. 28.7% of global manufacturing comes from China alone. Let me repeat that. 28.7% over a quarter of the world's manufacturing comes from the country of China, meaning that the country has a lot of demand for its goods, which will support the value of its currency through these monetary actions. It's not to say that the currency is immune to devaluation and very high inflation as a result. It is to say that with a massive trade surplus, there is wiggle room for active monetary policy here. So similar to how there was a bailout for certain US banks during the 2008 financial crisis, we could very much expect to see further action from the Chinese government because they're very likely to be hands-on given that they're a communist state. <laughs> it's, it's sort of in the name of the philosophy. Yes, there might still be some correction in prices and many economic problems. And certainly along the way, people are going to suffer. But is a collapse likely in around the corner? Well, as of today, no. Uh, they're still kicking around. Now, obviously China is a very secretive state that has already tried to clamp down on the spreading of some of these stories. And what we're hearing about it does come primarily from state-run media. So keep that in mind. Uh, we could naturally come to a new realization that we couldn't yet see because of how opaque the system is. But the point of this video isn't to say that China is not in trouble and that there's not a concern here. It is to say, however, that to draw conclusions about where China is heading with certainty is a fool's errand. There's a great part in the book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Nobel Prize winning psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, that talks about how unreliable pundits are when it comes to predicting what will happen with an economy despite being experts in the subject matter. So even when given perfect information about what's going on in the country of China, we simply cannot predict what will happen in the future because even though we like to oversimplify the story and say people are mad about China's banking system, therefore the banking system will collapse, the truth is there are very many factors at play that will simultaneously influence what occurs. That includes the actions of the China Communist Party, the actions of individuals who are paying these mortgages, the actions of developers, the actions of banks, and even foreign parties. And unfortunately, thanks to hindsight bias, as these events actually occur, people change their recollection of what they originally believed to align with what happened. Coming out of the woodwork to say, see, I told you so, even though, they probably didn't. The brutal and 
Admittedly scary truth about China is that we don't know what will happen. There is a very real problem with incomplete real estate projects in the country of China. And given that 70% of household wealth in the country is tied to real estate, a collapse of that sector, and of course the banking sector, would not just be felt by banks, but of course households, the broader Chinese economy, and internationally, given how big of a market China is for the rest of the world. But at the same time, China's government would likely not go gentle into that good night. It would arguably be more aggressive than the US was back in 2008 when it was trying to salvage its own economy from the financial crisis. Yes, this might just extend the pain over a longer period of time, but it could certainly divert an immediate crisis. Truthfully, the best thing you can do is to avoid any pundit that's telling you what will happen with certainty, especially when they say over the next 34 days. Uh, that's a little too specific. Anyway, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope it was relatively unbiased. Obviously, China is a very politically charged issue. You know, there's a lot of bad things that happen within the country of China. But my goal is really just to present the facts about what the situation in China is. And yes, while they are a communist state and people can criticize that, it does change how they would react to a situation like that and naturally will impact how things play out. If you like this video, please do make sure to like and subscribe. It does help the channel tremendously. And let me know your thoughts on China, whether you're at the far end of believing that yes, a collapse is imminent, or you believe that this will likely wash over given the amount of authority that China has within its own economy. I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. Thanks for joining me. And as always, be safe out there.